Now, at this stage, you need to fasten your seat belts because we're about, <laughs> we're about to take off. Um, you know the way some of these modern aircraft, they have a camera on the nose of the plane, and as the plane takes on, it, the, the pictures are transmitted to the screen inside the plane, and as, as the plane takes off, you can see it wonderful, exhilarating to see the ground disappearing, and uh, wheels are taken up because they're no longer necessary, and... Um, uh, the higher you go, of course, the less resistance there is, especially as you go up beyond the clouds. So in this stage of prayer now that we've begun to speak about and that Teresa calls the prayer of quiet, uh, we need to let go of the wheels that enabled us to take off and allow God to bring us uh, through the clouds until we, we reach a uh, cruising altitude. Uh, the wheels are the meditation that maybe helped us up to this to make meaningful contact with God, which is the essence of prayer. But having acquired uh, the habit of prayer, we can now uh, dispense with the preliminaries. And Teresa devotes a good bit of time and space to this transition stage of prayer, from meditative prayer to contemplative prayer. And uh, don't be afraid of that word contemplative, because we're all contemplatives. You know, the, the mind has a rational faculty and it has a contemplative faculty. Right? We're, we're, we're over-rationalized, we're, we're thinking all the time, but the contemplative faculty is, you know, it's a looking faculty. It's like what you experience when you go out there under, under the night sky and you're taken out of yourself by the wonder of what you see. That's, that's the contemplative faculty being used, underused in our society, I would say, um, greatly underused by men, less so by women, they say anyway. Anyway, this is the transition stage that Teresa is talking about, and uh, Teresa feels that this really is where most people get stuck in prayer, and they're tempted to give it up, because it takes some time uh, to get used, to become acclimatised to this quieter prayer, because initially uh, the dominant impression one has is simply of doing nothing or wasting our time, and the temptation is to grab a book and start reading, at least to convince yourself that, well, I'm doing something at least, when in fact, all God might be asking of you is to be there with him in silence, allowing him uh, to take his delight in you. Uh, Teresa struggles for words to explain this kind of prayer. She says there are times when we experience that the Lord calms our faculties, and quiets the soul, and this will be the beginning of contemplation. Those who experience this prayer call it the prayer of quiet. In this prayer, the person enters into peace, or better, the Lord puts it at peace in his presence, so that all the faculties are calmed. The soul, the soul understands in another way, but it fails to understand how it understands. In this form of prayer, uh, the prayer of quiet, she says, that the, the active and the contemplative lives are joined, they merge, and as she says, Martha and Mary walk together. Take some getting used to, so she encourages her sisters to be patient and continue to give God the time in prayer, even though they may not get much satisfaction out of it at the time. Teresa was fond of saying that we pray for God's sake, not for our own because we want to give God the opportunity to be with us and to take his delight in us. We're always the ones to benefit, but you know, God always wants us to be with him in prayer. She used to say to the nuns, you'll often have to go to prayer as to the cross. Uh, and it can happen that it's often in our prayer and in our struggle in prayer that God uh, is purifying us and making us moulded into the image of his Son. Uh, this quiet, uh, wordless prayer is echoed uh, by her friend St. John of the Cross when he speaks about the beginnings of contemplative prayer. He says, learn to be still in God, fixing your loving attention upon him in the calm and peace of your understanding, although you may think yourself to be doing nothing. You're doing no small thing by pacifying the soul and bringing it into calm and peace. Uh, many Modern authors on the spiritual life speak about this area of prayer at the beginning of contemplation. People like Thomas Merton, uh, René Wyom, who was the founder of the Little Brothers of Jesus and the Little Sisters of Jesus, who followed the spirituality of Charles de Foucault. And another man, a Cistercian monk, André Louf, who puts it rather well this way. We reach an impasse, a necessary cul-de-sac, 
a blind alley, a blessed dead end. At this stage, we must quieten down, find a deep interior silence, and simply wait there until something else in our inner life rises to the surface. Well, not so much something else, he says, as someone else. This may sometimes be a long process. It's a matter of learning to surrender ourselves. Our own effort at prayer must gradually be taken up into and dissolved in God's action. Now God takes the initiative and we let him do it. Generally speaking, the deeper our prayer becomes, uh, the simpler it becomes until it's concentrated into that simple glance of love, which is one of the definitions of what contemplative prayer is. But of course, there are no shortcuts uh, to this state of contemplative prayer in the normal run of things. Uh, Only years of fidelity to the practice of prayer will generate the spirit of prayer. Uh, John Dalrymple, uh, a Scottish spiritual uh, writer, says, in order to pray everywhere all of the time, we have to start by praying somewhere some of the time. So one of the byproducts of that kind of contemplative prayer is that we're we're more together, we're more centred and recollected in going about our daily chores, and we're tuned in to God's wavelength better. In other words, we have acquired the habit of prayer the spirit of prayer, whereby the thought of God is never far away and we're inclined to bring God into everything that's happening to us. And this is a wonderfully invigorating development because it means we we see deeper into things and we can sense the presence of God all around us and in everything that happens. And this consequently gives us a clearer vision and a better perspective on everything. And the great thing about having that vivid awareness of God's presence at all times is that prayer continues to happen even in the middle of our daily chores, however busy we might be. And Therese herself was often in this situation, especially in the latter years when she had to travel all over Spain, found in these convents and monasteries. And uh, she remarks helpfully in the Book of the Foundations in Chapter 5, it would be a bad business if we could practice prayer only by getting alone in corners. I know that I cannot be alone for many hours. But, O Lord, how potent with you is a sigh issuing from the heart. A sigh of sorrow at the thought, not only that we are in this exile, but that we have no opportunity to enjoy the solitude which might give us enjoyment of you. So acquiring this state of habitual prayer means we begin to see things with what they call a contemplative eye. And we can find reminders of God at every turn. All kinds of everything remind me of you. And something of that is expressed in that lovely poem of Joseph Mary Plunkett, written, I believe, on the eve of his execution in 1916. Uh, Wonderful. These 12 images in this, I'll only read a few of them. I see his blood upon the rose, and in the stars the glory of his eyes. His body gleams amid eternal snows. His tears fall from the skies. I see his face in every flower. All pathways by his feet are worn. His strong heart stirs the ever-beating sea. His crown of thorns is twined with every thorn. His cross is every tree. Now, as I said, when Teresa is describing this this growing absorption in God, uh, she struggles for words. (laughs) If she struggles, I surely struggle. Uh, She struggles for words because she knows she's trying to describe the indescribable. So she uses images and reverts to one of her favourite images, that of water. Water figures prominently in her writings as it figured prominently in her life, in the life of all Spaniards, because there wasn't enough of it in some parts of Spain. And in the middle part of the book of her life, her autobiography, that's chapter 11 up to chapter 20, Teresa uses the image of water to convey her thought about the developing stages of prayer and to show the increasing role of God as that development takes place. Uh, She says there are four ways in which a garden can be watered. Number one, by drawing the water from a well, uh, pulling the bucket up each time and carrying it, and that's strenuous work, we all know that. Number two, maybe by means of a pump or a water wheel, as she would say which involves, if it's on site, it just means operating the handle, and that way you get more water with less effort. Third way to clever this, uh, irrigation, 
whereby you would reroute a stream or a river and you have the water there to hand and it involves almost no work once you set it up. And finally, she says, the best way of all, rain, which involves no work at all and is the most effective and no water charges. <laughs> so corresponding to each of these ways of watering a garden, then Teresa comes up with four stages of prayer, indicating the, the decrease in our activity and the increase in God's. First is what we spoke about there, mental prayer, discursive meditation, where, you know, the effort of finding time for prayer, trying to reflect on the life of Jesus or some other spiritual uh, topic has a prominent part, and we're coping with distractions and all this. Second stage, a bit easier, where our prayer becomes simpler and we are able to focus better on God without too much thinking, even though we still have the effort of making the time for prayer. That's the, the water wheel. But then by doing that on a regular basis, over a period of time, we develop the habit of prayer and then this permanent sense of God's presence and the heightened awareness of God dwelling uh, within us. That's the river or the stream, until finally, in what she calls the prayer of union, God merges with our thought, with our whole being. And as St. John of the Cross says, all our activity <coughs> is in loving alone, or St. Paul has something like it, I live now, not I, but Christ lives in me. And in Teresa's great classic, The Interior Castle, the last of her works that she wrote five years before she died, as you know, it contains these seven mansions of growing beauty the closer we come to the king in the centre. Uh, the first two mansions would correspond to the, that first stage of watering, watering with the bucket, uh, the ordinary grace of God, which we can do um, also uh, by means of our, our own efforts. And then the third and fourth mansions of that transition stage we spoke about when meditation dries up and God is calling us to a prayer that's quieter, uh, more passive, less of the head and more of the heart. And then the last three mansions are analogous to the easier ways of watering where God takes the lead and draws us towards the centre uh, without much effort needed on our part. I'm coming into land now or rather maybe with Teresa I'm disappearing into the stratosphere altogether. In the final chapters of that great masterpiece, The Interior Castle, Teresa speaks in great detail about the, the soul's ever-increasing absorption in God, uh, culminating in that closeness to God that the mystics call the spiritual marriage or the mystical marriage, which Teresa herself did attain, probably had attained, since the day her heart was pierced by the arrow of God's love, and that was ten years before she died. It's famously represented by Bernini's sculpture, which is in one of our churches in Rome. Uh, Teresa describes this moment in chapter 29 of her life. I saw close to me an angel in bodily form. I saw in his hands a large golden dart, and at the end of the iron tip there appeared to be a little fire. He plunged the dart several times into my heart and it reached deep within me. When he drew it out, I thought he was carrying off with him the deepest part of me and he left me all on fire with great love of God. So such are the heights that Teresa attained and she so uh, passionately invites us on to as well because she believed with all her heart that we're all called to that, certainly in the next life, but she would say that we give greater uh, delight and glory to God by making a start in this life. She is, of course, as always, realistic enough to know that most of us struggle, as she struggled herself. Uh, besides, uh, God brings us by varying routes on this journey. He's divinely free and each journey is personal. Uh, be that as it may, uh, Teresa will never let us off the hook or allow us to say that that's not for us because she would say transformation is our common destiny. And one of her most beautiful images, I give you this in the handout afterwards, she speaks about the process by which a silkworm weaves silk and dies in the process and a beautiful butterfly emerges from the cocoon an image of the, the transformation affected by God in the person who is suffused with his light. And in this state of transformation, uh, Teresa can echo the ecstatic words of her friend, again, St. John of the Cross, Mine are the heavens and mine is the earth. Mine are the nations. The just are mine and mine the sinners. The angels are mine and the mother of God and all things are mine. 
and God himself is mine and for me, because Christ is mine and all for me. What do you ask then and seek, my soul? Yours is all of this and all is for you. Do not engage yourself in something less or pay attention to the crumbs that fall from your father's table. Go forth and exult in your glory. And all this, you'll be glad to hear, is perfectly compatible with old age and with the diminishment of the years. And it's lovely to read uh, Teresa's final spiritual testimony, number 65. Reminds me a bit of the, the musings of Peg Sayers, whose reminiscences form part of our Irish curriculum long ago for our leaving cert, Smint the uh, Teresa is now old and feeble, but she is accepting of her condition. And you can see that the light of God still shines in her heart and the beauty of her closeness to God still energises her weak body. It seems now, she says, that I live only to eat and sleep and not suffer in anything, but it doesn't bother me. The presence of the three persons of the Trinity is so impossible to doubt that it seems I experience what St. John the Evangelist says that they will make their abode in the soul. This presence is almost continual, except when a lot of sickness weighs down on me. As a child, Teresa said that she wanted to see God and she hoped she'd be able to do that quickly by being martyred. But it turned out that she was in it for the long haul and in spite of having unusual and wonderful experiences of God in her lifetime, still on her deathbed, her final words were, It's time, Lord, that we see one another. And she went forth to exult in her glory. And here we are, 400 plus years later, uh, still deriving inspiration from the richness of her life, uh, still imbibing her wisdom and still basking in the radiance of the light of this uh, undaunted, undaunted daughter of desires. And long may we do so. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.